Okay. Good morning. Uh, Marcel asked me to <coughs> speak in English this time, if that's okay with you. Uh, so, so my plan was to, to give you about 20 minutes uh, discussion about how a neurobiologist like myself looks at the issue of creativity in our brain and then have some time to discuss, to discuss, to have questions and so forth. I hope we shall have enough time because I didn't plan this 20 minutes uh, delay and I have another meeting at 12.30. Uh, so let's start. Um, <coughs> so let's start. So I, I want to start by reminding us all that we, uh, we, I mean mammalians, Yon Kim, lived something like uh, 200 million years ago. So the, the mammalian species came about 200 million years ago. We are a very advanced mammalian, but still a mammalian. And as you know, <coughs> something like about four to eight million years, we, uh, we started as chimpanzees, but there, were, there was this evolutionary change, which we shall discuss in a second. And, and some, some, some eight, years, eight million years ago, uh, we developed into a Homo sapiens. As you know, along the way, through this divergence, there were uh, other hominids, not only Homo sapiens, but there were other hominids, like the Neanderthals, who lived together with us some 30,000 years ago. But today, we are the only hominids, the only Homo, sapi homos, uh, homo sapiens in our case. So we are the Homo sapiens. This is million years back. You can see the evolution of our skull, of our brain. And about 200,000 years ago, which is very, very recent, actually, in terms of the evolutionary time, so this is very recent, about 200,000 years ago, we came as a species. So we know that our genome, which is a specific genome of the Yum Homo sapiens, is a very recent genome. It's 200,000 years ago. And when I say our genome, I mean that during this period, of 200,000 years ago, this is the yellow region here, there is no genetic change in our genes. So we are not changing genetically. Uh, we have a little differences between one of us to the other of us, but there is no change in our genes. So we are the same species genetically for 200,000 years ago. Still, and that's the interesting aspect of creativity, be, although there are no changes in our genes during this period of time, there is a huge, as you know very well, a huge creative process in our brain, although there is no change in our genes. So you cannot explain, for example, the fact that the written language was created something like 5,000 years ago. We started to create written language. You cannot assign it to a genetic change. You cannot say that there is a new gene, and because of this new gene, I am starting to write. We are starting to write. No. In principle, we could start to write 200,000 years ago, but because of different conditions that this person that lived here uh, had to solve, because he had to solve other things like we are trying to solve today, because he has to solve you know, the issue of living, uh, temperature, uh, fire, uh, animals, and so forth, he didn't, he didn't create this capability at that point in time of lang written language or the invention of science or the invention of computers. You can see how recent all these things are. So something about our brain is apparently creative, could create new things, will create new things. So if we, should see, if we should be here 20 years from now, or 100 years from now, the world will look very, very different than today, as I'm sure you are aware of. There will be robot walking, change instead of us. There will be cars within five years that drives automatically, uh, driveless cars and so forth. So this is all creation of our existing brain for 200,000 years. So, so what makes us so unique? What is special about our brain? Uh, then that's, that's something that, of course, neuro, neurobiologists like myself, I am a, theoreti a theoretical neurobiologist at the Hebrew University, trying to understand certain things. So we don't know for sure exactly what makes our brain different than our, the brain of a chimpanzee, for example, but we have some theories or some ideas that I will share with you today. What makes us unique? But before I'm going to tell you what makes us unique, I want to explain something fundamental about the brain, very, very fundamental, which, which might sound to you a little bit strange, but that's how neurobiologists or neuroscientists think about the brain. I, I, I brought you an example of what does it mean a brain state, a state of a brain. A state could be a state of a creative state, it could be sleep state, it could be a state of a disease, but it's a brain state. I want to, to give you an example 
what do, what do I mean by saying the brain is in a state? Okay, so this is Hagai Bergman working here with us at the Hebrew University. He's the world expert by far on Parkinson, and he was the first one to discover the following discovery, which explains what does it mean a brain state, in this case a Parkinsonian state. Easier to see a state of a disease than a state of a creative state or a belief that you believe in God. It's a state of your brain. Or you don't believe in God, like myself. It's a state of the brain. So, so what is a state? So, so Hagai Bergman developed a technique, without going into details, that you can record the activity of a group of nerve cells, of neurons, in a particular region of the brain. And you can see a normal brain. When I see a normal brain, when I say a normal brain, I mean this is electrical activity. This is a very, very stereotypic electrical activity of an, a single nerve cell in your brain now. So if I would record in your brain a single cell activity, I will see something like that. This is, these are called spikes. So this is electrical pulses. These are short pulses, electrical pulses. Tenth of a, milli tenth of a volt high. So the amplitude here is tenth of a volt. Not 220 volts, but the maximal activity in your brain is tenth of a volt, 100 millivolts. And each one of these spikes lasts one millisecond, a, hundred, a thousandth of a second. So it appears and disappears, appears and disappears. And this is the prototypical uh, activity of any brain. Mouse brain, monkey's brain, cat's brain, cockroach brain, any brain, any nerve cell in any animal generates this particular spike. So this is a universal, it's a universal activity. But of course, each cell has its own pattern of activity, or if you want, barcode of activity. So this cell, ta 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 stop. Ta 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 And when I say ta 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 ta, I mean electrical activity. Spike, 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 stop, spike, spike, spike. So this is the code in your brain. So you don't have movies in your brain, and you don't have sound in your brain, of course. You just have spikes in your brain. So this is the code in your brain that codes for anything, everything. When I move my hand now, there is a code in a particular region of my brain that, that is active, and this activity codes for this movement. And when I see a face, and I know that this is a face, there is an activity in a region that recognizes faces, and this activity represents a face. But there is no movie in my brain, only electrical activities, electrical and chemical activities. That's all. There is nothing else in your brain. That's all. So, so this is a state of your brain, and this is a normal brain, let's call it like this. But Hagai found <coughs> that in Parkinson, you have another state of the brain. So the brain goes to a new electrical state. And this is, is represented here. So when you record in a Parkinsonian monkey in this case, monkeys also have Parkinson, you see completely different activity pattern. You see that the cell starts to fire with this little burst, ta-ta-ta, stop, like a machine gun. Ta-ta-ta, spike, 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 stop, spike, 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 stop. And the whole network, not only a single cell, here each one is individually firing, here all the cells start to fire together, this electrical activity. So the whole network is firing, firing stop, ta-ta-ta, stop, ta-ta-ta, stop. So this is a manifestation, this is a fingerprint of par Parkinson. Whenever you go to the brain of a Parkinsonian uh, patient, you will see in this particular region, this particular activity. So this is a state of the brain. Okay, so that's what I wanted to explain to you. There is a state, a sleep state, different stages of sleep, and the creative state, or any other state. Whatever you, you feel or you think or an idea that comes, it's a state of the brain. Is that, is that clear, what I mean by a state? And I, again, th there is nothing else. There is no mystical things running here. It's only activity, electrical activity, and that's it. There is nothing else. You may not like to hear it, but, but that's it. That's it. So, so just to show you what you can do b with these states, because you realize that anything is a state, you may manipulate the state by an electrical input or impulse. So this is what we do today for Parkinson, to treat the state of Parkinson. You take a battery, which originally was designed to pace make the heart. So this is a heart pacemaker. But in this case, instead of pace making the heart electrically, to pace make, let's say, the heart 60 times a minute. 
In this case, you take the electrical activity with different parameters, but you make, a, a, you make an operation to the Parkinsonian patient, you implant an electrode, electrical electrode, and you inject current into this particular location that I just showed you before that is, was sick with Parkinson. So I want to show you an example of a success of intervening with the state of the brain. So this is a Parkinsonian patient from Adassa Medical School here. So you know what Parkinson is. It's a, it's a very difficult disease of generating motion, balancing yourself. Doing this is impossible for a Parkinsonian patient because he cannot pace make his own rhythm. It is pace made by this rhythm of the brain. So he's, he's trembling, Parkinsonian patient. So he's in a state of Parkinson. His brain is in the state of Parkinson. And the manifestation is this tremor and everything related to Parkinson. So the balance is very bad and so forth. Okay, so, and he cannot do that. Because when I'm doing that, I'm certainly not sick of Parkinson. I have no state of Parkinson because I can, I can myself decide on the rhythm. And he cannot because it's generated. Okay, so you do this fast operation. He is completely alert. You just you implant this very fine electrode to the correct location. They do it twice a week in Adasa. And then you start to find the best parameters, the electrical parameters, to intervene with the wrong state in order to bring the brain to the correct state. And that's what happens after this injection. Now he's getting injection, and that's the same patient getting now pulses into the brain, and you fix the state, the electrical state that was wrong. You fix it by injecting particular set of inputs. You can see that it's almost hard, almost impossible to see that this is a Parkinsonian patient. And when you stop the electrical activity or injection, he becomes Parkinsonian again. Okay, so you can see that you can do things that Parkinsonian patient cannot. So, so it, we, we change the state of the brain by injecting current. This is called deep, deep brain stimulation. I, I, on, I only used it just to give you an example of a state of a brain. I could intervene with your emotions by injecting particular current, you'll feel in love. I could inject here, your hand will move. I could inject particular set of pulses here, you will see a face. Okay, because I intervene with the state of the brain. Okay, so creativity is a state of the brain, which every one of us wants to be in this creative state, but it's a particular set of activity which causes, so to speak, you to do something new, something creative. Okay? So that's what I wanted to explain to you, the notion of a state of the brain. Before I'm going to human, I just wanted to say that we are not the only creative creature, but we are the most creative creature. This is an example of a monkey female monkey that was known to be the Cezanne of the apes. And her, her hair, thousands of paintings are sold for a very high uh, prices, even more than Andy Warhol, for example. And this is another very creative chimpanzees. By the way, the creative, the, among the chimpanzees, the, the females are more creative than the, the male. This is an example of a creative chimpanzee female in a very interesting uh, institute. It's called the Max Planck Institute. Max Planck is a very prestigious set of institutes in Germany. This is the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig for evolutionary biology. And they want to ask questions about creativity and cognition of different animals, monkeys, and so forth. This is an example of a problem given to a monkey. So this is a chimpanzee. The, you, give, you give her a little tube, and inside the tube there is a peanut. Deep inside the tube there is a peanut, and she's hungry. So she needs to find a creative solution to how to get this peanut. Yes, and you will see what she did. <coughs> Something different than what you would do, it's certainly me. This is her solution. At the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany, psychologist Joseph Kohl places a peanut inside a clear tube. Th this is the peanut here. How can the chimpanzee get the snack? She's never seen this puzzle before. For 10 minutes, there's no solution in sight. And all of a sudden, boom, they solve it. Okay, this is an amazing creative solution, yes? You know what I would do in this case? I will absolutely, certainly break it. They have to understand that they can break use it. The, the but, but she's doing something else. So, 
Why is it so creative? Because she needs to understand somehow deep inside. First of all, she went to think for 10 minutes. So something went on there. And then she came with a solution. So, so, so there, was, there was this thinking aspect, this creative solution. She realized that something floats on something else, and water can make this peanut floats on water. This is a creative solution. So we are not the only creative animals, but we are very creative because these things nobody can do beside us. So if you haven't yet uh, visited the, this, the prehistoric caves in south of France, north of Spain, Altamira, and this is the oldest one, Chavot, uh, 30,000 years ago, very old and just, just discovered 10, 20 or 30 years ago. So this is the, the newest and oldest uh, cave. This is the well, most well-known, the, the Lascaux. These things no, no animal that we know can do, could do. Neither the Neanderthals, who, as I said, lived in south of France together with us at the same time. But we don't have drawings from the Neanderthals. We don't have paintings from the Neanderthals. This is Homo sapiens, this capability to remember something from the outside and then come to the canvas or come to the stone and redraw something that you remember from different places. This is very unique capability to remember and to then physically recreate your memory. It's a very, very sophisticated capability that we don't know of any other animal that could do it. It's interesting that about 30,000 years ago, or 10,000, 50,000, all this was created. Art was created. The most beautiful thing that was created, I think, by human science also, is art. But this is the same time at different locations. You can see in, Aus in Austria, Australia, in Russia, and France, this, this, this female uh, sculptures were created by this brain at the same time. So wh wh what's going on in our brain that makes this possible? So let me do five calculations, uh, co uh, five uh, hypotheses, just to tell you first one, just a point. It's not, this, it's, not, it's not the size of your brain. It's not that the people with bigger brain are more creative. No. It's not the size of the brain. And this is one proof. So Albert Einstein has a very, very, very small brain, much smaller than any one of you. And uh, I'm sure you know that this was the most, absolutely the most creative scientist probably ever. Uh, Anatole France has even a smaller brain. So typically with such small brains, people will put them into hospital because something is wrong with the huge, uh, so small. Your brain is 1.4 kilograms. This is much, much, much lower than any brain that you have. So there are, it's not the size. So what is it? So clearly one aspect of creativity is the number of cells in your brain, <coughs> the number of nerve cells in your brain. So these are mammalian world, these are different mammals, very small mammals, chimpanzees and others, and this is our brain. And I can tell you that recent counts, and we have now new techniques to count how many nerve cells you have in your brain, you have 100 billion. Billion is a thousand of a million, and 100 billion is a hundred of a thousand of a million. Huge amount, huge, of, of elements, of, of microchips. Each nerve cell is a microchip, it computes something. It computes the direction of motion. It reminds me that I want to, to, to take a glass. It takes the glass, it does this very sophisticated movement that we don't know how to even generate robots that can do it so smoothly. So this is a, a computation by this microchip. So of course, when you have more microchips, you are more sophisticated. We have a huge number of microchips, much larger than any of our size animals, although we now know that the whales have huge brains, the whale have four kilogram brains, much bigger, and they have more cells than us. So it's not just the number of cells, but clearly if you, if you had only two cells in your brain, you wouldn't be very creative, I can assure you. Because you, you didn't have many states. You need to have more states in order to be more creative. So the fact that we have so many nerve cells is one aspect of creativity. The other aspect of creativity is the fact that in our brain, and this is a technique that, sh that enables uh, to look at a living, non-invasively brain and look at connections between different regions. It's called, it's called diffusion tensor imaging. It's, it's some sort of MRI. So you can, you can image the brain of a mouse or of a chimpanzee or of a human and look at the connectivity of the fibers that connect one region to the other. You can see how connected our brain is. You can see that the, unlike the mouse, where the connections are not so intense in the human, every region in the brain is very intensely connected via, via fibers to other regions. This means that information from my visual system 
goes to my auditory system, to my motor system, to my emotional system. We are very connected brain. So any activity in any region will activate another activity in another region. And this is certainly aspect of creativity because I'll give you an example. When I create a notion, let's say, of a glass, I'm saying now glass. Okay, it's an arbitrary set of, war of, of, of vowels, glass, could be something else. But we s decided that this is glass. But when I mean glass, when I say glass, I mean shape. I mean also the content. So the s shape is a visual aspect of the glass. The content is water, so there is a taste to this water. And there is also the touch aspect, because this glass is a soft glass, it's okay? So this is another sense. So I'm j by saying a glass, I'm, I connect many senses automatically. So it's not only visual, it's not only taste, it's on only touch, it's all of it together enables me to create the notion of a glass. So language, which is a, the most creative thing we did, is the capability to summarize within a set of symbols something in the world, glass, tree, face, love. All this thing is, is enabled because our senses are connected so strongly. A monkey cannot create language because for him, and we have some nice experiments, I don't want to go into it because I want you to ask questions later, you can see that, that a monkey, when a monkey touches by, a when his eyes are closed, when he touches, let's say, a circle or a sphere and gets money, uh, sorry, gets food for it, so he touches a sphere <laughs> and gets food, he touches a sphere and gets food, he very fast learns by, with closed eyes to touch this, the, the sphere because he knows that the sphere is connected to the food. So this is the touch. But when you open the eyes of the monkey, he doesn't know that this sphere is the thing that gives him, uh, uh, gives him, gives him uh, the food. It gives, he needs to learn by vision that this is the same thing that he touched. And you don't need to do it, of course, because when you touch a sphere, immediately, automatically, you will have an image of a sphere in your visual system. Why? Because your touch system, which is here, connects automatically to the visual system, and you generate an image automatically. The, the, the monkey cannot do it. So he cannot create a notion of a glass, because he has a visual glass, he has a touch glass, he has a taste glass, and it's not the same thing. Okay? So creativity comes, fr in our case, because we can merge senses because of this connectivity in the brain. Okay, so that's the second uh, uh, idea. The third idea about creativity is local connectivity. I spoke before about distant connectivity between regions. I want to show you a piece of a cubic millimeter, and this is a project I'm involved with. It's called the Human Brain Project. And in this human brain project, we reconstruct and simulate in the computer cubic millimeter of a mammalian, in this case, of a mouse brain. So this is what happens in your brain. If I take a cubic millimeter, which is like the head of a, a pinhead, very small, cubic millimeter is something very small, you have four kilometers of wires, about 100 million of connections, and 100,000 of cells within a cubic millimeter. So your brain is a to total jungle, locally. Locally, is a jungle of nerve cells because you have to compress 100 billion cells in your brain, which means that every cubic millimeter is very, very dense. It's really jungle containing of huge amount of cells. So why, why is it so interesting? Because in human, we know the local connectivity between cells, the amount of cells locally within a cubic millimeter is bigger than any in any other animal. So we are not only connected between regions, we are also connected locally very strongly. Yeah, so uh, this is an example of your brain, of a brain of a child. It's very sparse, few cells. And when you are about six years old, you have the final network, local network for in your cortex, for example. And then you start to create all those huge connectivity, synapses it is called. And at the age of six, you have the total fixed number of synapses, fixed number of cells. But still, of course, you can learn and change and this is a whole another lecture about what happens in your brain when you learn something new. Because it cannot be the same brain before you learn something new. So your brain is changing physically now, anatomically it's changing now, in order to create a network, physical network, not by adding cells, but making new connections. And these new connections generate new state. Because these cells will tend to work together and may remember my lecture or my face or the fact that you've been here. So that your brain is changing due to this connectivity. 
the more connections you have between cells, the more states of the brain you can generate. So the fact that we have so many cells and so many local connections, much more than any other animal that we know, so just to give you numbers, so individual one cell in your brain, one individual cell receives about 30,000 connections from other cells. 30,000 synapses per one cell. In the mouse, it's about half of it. So our nerve cells are highly connected to the neighboring cells, also to distant cells, and this means that when I'm active, I'm talking to 30,000 other cells, and they are talking to 30 other thousand cells. So this means that we have a lot of activity because of this local strong connectivity. So it's not only between regions we are we're well connected, but also locally. This also brings our, our brain to many, many possible future states. Who knows where we are going to? Future states, it could be destructive states, it could be creative states, but new states could emerge because of this local connectivity that can change all the time while we learn. We are very connected brain, both distally, but also locally. There is another aspect of the brain which is more difficult. You have to understand that in my machine here, the, there was a lot of effort done to quiet down the physical noise. You know that any system, any electrical system has local noise, electrical noise. Not noise of the ear, but local noise, electrical noise. And if you want this machine to be reliable, and each time that you press the letter A, it will appear A, you don't want noisy elements, noisy microchip, you want to make the microchip very, very quiet, electrically. So they will be reliable. But our, our microchips in the brain are not reliable. This is the electrical noise, which is spontaneous noise, all the time, in your brain, in each of your cells, which makes your brain unreliable. Meaning that when I give you the same input, you see my face once, and then you see my face another time, it doesn't represent it exactly the same way. Just because all the time you have this noisy thing underlying the activity, so this is the big activity, these are the spikes, but under, below the spike, so to speak, there is this activity, which makes the spike appear and disappear a little bit at different location in time and space. This means that you never represent the same thing in your brain exactly the same, unlike in the computer. You are not reliable brain. So we are very different from this computer. And th that's very good for creativity, because you don't want the same input to create exactly the same response each time. You want certain input to suddenly create something new. And this noise helps you to do it. So it's good that our brain is noisy. You don't want too much noise, ele electrical noise. For epileptic seizure is a big noise in your brain. Suddenly you have huge noise. That means that the whole brain becomes electrical active. That's not a good noise. But a little bit of noise, and creative people tell you, could tell you that when they create, they are sometimes a little bit sick with a little fever, not too much, but a little fever, and this little fever increases this spontaneous noise. So you may get to new states of the brain spontaneously, and this new state could be a new idea, a new, a, a new technology, or something like that. Okay. So, so just let me finish by showing the, the, the next final thing. Uh, of course, we can speak more about that, but then we ha you, I'm sure you have questions, but I just want to show you something that we are now trying to do these days, uh, following this amazing woman, uh, Nadia, who is well known for her capability at the age of five years old to uh, draw horses, most beautiful horses. So ju just put one, one, by s one side by side the Leonardo da Vinci horses, and Nadia, still Leonardo da Vinci is probably a, a greater artist, but it's quite amazing that an autistic girl, savant autistic girl, a savant autism is those that could do something amazing, let's multiplying numbers, but they are of course autistic in other aspects, and she's very unique, and of course the question is, are we all savant autistic? Could we all generate new things in our brain, not necessarily being autistic, but could we all generate new things, but our brain is not in this creative state? So the idea who came by this specific unusual guy, and this is another fellow that you might know, Oliver Sacks, is a neurologist who just died. He's getting a, s a pulse in his brain in order to ask the following question. Can I generate activity by external stimuli? Non-invasive stimuli, which is called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
can I get a stimulus in my brain which will make it more creative? Can I intervene electrically with your brain, not in order to fix Parkinson, but in order to make you more creative? Can I do that? Certainly, I should be able to do it in principle at least because I'm sure that I'm not activating all my capabilities. Maybe I could be an artist, not a professor. Maybe I could be, I don't know, a dancer. But I didn't, I didn't practice it. I didn't use my networks in the brain to do that. I did that. But could I do something else? Of course I could, in principle. But, but how do you, we do it? That's a big question of creativity. But here, I, an example showing that when you be forced, so this is uh, Oliver Sacks, and this is another patient, so to speak, getting this stimuli. So this is, uh, like myself, I, I'm a very bad uh, uh, painter, so I would probably draw by seeing a cat or a dog, I would draw something that looks like that of a child or something like that. So this is an example of two people that are not very good painters, but, w but this is before getting this stimuli in their brain. Then they get these 10 minutes pulses into the frontal lobe, which is known to be a place of creativity, of active region, active networks that are related to creativity. And after the 10 minutes stimuli, there is an improvement, one may say, an improvement in the capability to generate a movement. So you look at the, at, the, at the cat and you have to copy the cat. So you need to have this visual motor loop. You see something, you create a movement. You see something, you create a movement. And this movement should replicate what you see. So you can see that something is improved for a while. And then I can tell you that after some time, it's gone. So you succeeded somehow to generate the capability that was hidden there, inhibited there. You generate a little bit of a capability to do something new during stimulation and a little bit after stimulation, and then it's gone and you become again a bad painter. So you can, in, you can intervene. So all this, all this, uh, all this uh, direction of, of neuroscience is called augmenting cognition. Can you augment your cognition? Can you augment your creativity? In this case, by direct intervention, intervention by drugs, by stimulus, not that I recommend it, but it's a question. It's a question, how much can I generate new things by, by intervening with the brain? And of course, when I talk to you, I also intervene with your brain. When you talk to each other, you intervene with your brain. But this seems to be a better way to generate new things. So I want to, fi to, to, com to, s to say the following. <coughs> I'm not a bi big believer of using drugs or stimulating your brain to generate new ideas or to make you more creative. I'm not, a, I'm not for that. Although I know that it's almost impo impossible to stop this direction when you generate something new in science, somebody will use it somewhere. But for the meantime, this is my recommendations because I would like all of us, including of course myself, to become Leonardo da Vinci. He is the example for me of a very creative, not only in one field, but in many fields, as you know, he was an architect, he was a designer, he was a scientist. It was a painter, wonderful, and so forth. So this, you want Leonardo da Vinci's, and we are possibly much, much more Leonardo da Vinci's that we know we are. But how do we make us broad in that sense? So one thing that we are doing very badly, I mean we are the universities, is we separate science from the arts, physically. It's different departments. This is in Mount Scopus. This is here and this is there. And they very rarely start to even talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. And that's, I think, very bad for the brain. Because you become one-minded, one thing. You know to do this. You're afraid of the other thing. Also, we have museums. You have your museums for art and museum for science. Why? Why this split? Why this split? Don't you want the child? to go to a museum and see Einstein here, relativity theory here, and Picasso here, the cubism here. Why should it be in different places? This means that these are different things, but they are not different things. They come from the brain, both. So I think we have to go towards merging, merging fields rather than splitting fields, as we do in the universities not, and museums and so forth. So that's, that's one, one thing I can do, by the way. I don't know if you have a website for this. Uh, that creative mornings, but if you would have a, a website, I would put my lecture there, upload the link, and then you can download my, my lecture that you don't need to. So I don't want to go all over uh, what I think should be done, and I think this, this kind of meetings, especially with, between a scientist and creative people in other fields, is, is very important, not just one time, 
but to create something more sustainable and more continuous. And this, this will bring some new frictions and new ideas between, let's say, art and science. Okay, I just want to end by Einstein, because as I said, he was one example of a very creative person. And also playing piano, uh, the violin, and also you know, making love to many women. You know, he was very creative, really seriously. He had many women, and still today we find grandchildren of Einstein somewhere in the world. He's this unusual person. Especially this first, uh, you know that nine, nine, 905 is the, what is called the magical year of Einstein. It's one year, in one year, 905, which is not far from the year of 907, where Cubism started by Picasso. So maybe there is some links, and there is a beautiful book called Einstein and Picasso, because at the same period of time, there were a burst of creativity, both in science and art. That's an interesting thing about this simultaneity of, of creativity. But about Einstein, just to say, that he said the following thing, which I think is a very nice sentence to, to end the lecture like that. It would be possible to describe everything scientifically, as I try to do now. But it would make no sense. It would be without meaning. As if you describe a Beethoven symphony as a variation of waves of pressure. Of course, wa Beethoven symphony is only waves of pressure on your ear. There is a violin and there is a pressure on your ear and you, and you hear a violin. But it will be meaningful, meaningless to just describe it at that level. So, but the role of science is to do exactly that do it scientifically. The role of human sciences, humanities, is to give a meaning to what you do. Okay? So this is beyond science. Science is limited to describe things physically. The meaning comes from other sciences. Still, there is nothing else in your brain beside electrical activity. This is clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Whoa. <laughs> um, we have time for like two questions. Um, we really have to wrap up. Dina. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dina. Um, my question is, um, as a scientist who's thinking all the time about how the brain is made up of cells and you know the electric pulses and all that, are you personally still amazed and in awe of creativity, and if so, why? Absolutely. I, as I said, I, I didn't really explain, and I probably will not be able really to explain ex exactly what, what is this creative process is. Why at some location, and of course I'm, I would like to be more creative than I am, and I'm asking all the time the question, w where should I go? So Virginia Woolf would say, a room for oneself. You need your room and a little bit of money, that's a place where I am creative. Am I creative at the university? Is the university the best place for me and my students to create new things? Or should I go to the beach? Or should I go, should I run? Or, or what is the create, for me, I cannot give a general formula for creativity, but what is the best time, location, emotional state that where I come with a new idea? Of course I'm all the time, I would like to do it and become better, that's clear. And I'm trying to explain it on a physiological level, but this, of course, doesn't help me individually to find my little spot, location, relationship, whatever, that makes me creative. So absolutely, I think it's the most fascinating thing about the human brain, is the capability to generate something new. Why the chimpanzees cannot do it? I explained a little bit. Connectivity-wise, number of cells and so forth. So there is a, bit more, a genetic jump that generates a new brain which is a little, by the way, the bra our brain and the brain of the Neanderthals were very, very similar. But sufficiently different, as we know today genetically, that they were not creative and we were creative and they disappeared. And we ruled the world completely as, as, as a species. We ruled the world very aggressively, as you know, very aggressively. We destroy every other species that was with us, yes? We destroy them. You should read Yuval Noah Harari and see what he thinks about the human being. But anyway, so it's a very unique brain that can generate wonderful things, and I would like to know where are we going? What else could I do with my brain in 100 years, I mean our brain? On the other hand, I know that we are very destructive, so it's a very fundamental issue to, to think about, to discuss creativity. It's the most wonderful, the most dangerous thing we have is this 
capability of our brain to generate new things, arms, art, everything. More question? Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if we are comparing uh, two human beings or two brains, so what makes uh, some brain more uh, creatively than others? And is it something genetically, or something that could be taught, or something that could be learned? First of all, I want, uh, okay, so I cannot answer this question. <laughs> we don't know physically what makes one individual different than the other in principle. I don't know one, uh, why you are you and I am I in terms of your capabilities. I don't know. I don't know even at the level of mouse. There are mouse, two, you can take two mice, put them in the same maze. You can see that one is much more creative than the other in terms of finding the cheese or understanding the maze. So there are differences in the brain of even simpler animals than us. And I cannot today, today, correlate something about the structure, connectivity, activity of this brain and say that this brain is more active than this brain because of, I don't know. I'm not at that level yet, at all. I'm not at the, at the level of individuality. I'm at the level of a general description of a brain as a brain. I cannot compare brains. I don't know why Einstein was so creative. He had the same number of cells, the same number of synapses, but still he was Einstein and I'm not Einstein. Why? Of course I would like to know, but I cannot say anything about that. It's certainly not about the physical aspect of the numbers. It's something about the, the activity the flow of information in the brain of Einstein because of something about the connectivity generate new states, so relativity theory, new states, the photon and so forth. This five, five Nobel Prize in one year he could get. I don't know. So he cannot answer this fundamental question. Certainly you can enhance your creativity. This we know. We know that certain challenges in the mice will make the mice more creative in solving certain things of a particular mice. You can generate him to become more creative if you challenge him with a challenge environment. Certainly if you stay in the same environment and you do the same thing, you are not going to be creative, that's for sure. So we know that the challenge environment is something good for a creative brain. But why one this brain is, is different than the other, this I don't know. <laughs>